Hello and welcome to a chess Yes. Today we are going to have an amazing, relaxing time with an absolutely remarkable game. What you see here on the screen is with the white pieces, a chess player by the name of Hikaru Nakamura, who opens up a game with pawn to e4. And on the other side, with the black pieces, we have a player called Vedit Gushrati. And if you notice what he's doing, it's a suggestion to you and me and all of us. He's playing this extremely important game of chess, but he doesn't make a move. He closes his eyes. As I suggest, you close your eyes. He relaxes, then he starts meditating. I suggest that you stay with him and with me, just blocking out all the noise and just focus on the chess. In this very moment, and when Vidit comes out, he responds to Nakamura's opening move with pawn to e5. And Vidit, in this game, is going to do the impossible. So I will show you on this chessboard all the moves that they played, and I will show you why they played them. But before I do, I will give you a little bit of context. Maybe you don't watch, you know, the chess news. Maybe you don't know who these players are. And if that's the case, I would like you to welcome you in to the world of chess. Many people think that this is an exclusive place. It is not. You are very, very Welcome here. With the white pieces we have Hikaru Nakamura. He's an American. And he has been the best performing chess players. He has been the best performing chess player in the entire world. Uh, all of last year, in 2023. He was even outperforming the magnificent Magnus Carlsen. In classical chess, he had a better performance rating. Hikaru Nakamura has not lost a game in 2024. He has not lost a game in 2023. In fact, the last time Hikaru Nakamura lost a game was in 2022, and it was in the very same tournament that he is currently playing, the so-called Candidates Tournament. What is the Candidates Tournament? The Candidates Tournament is a tournament for the best players in the world. They have gone through an excruciating uh, selection process where they would have, they have proven their chess genius in various ways and they have been therefore they have therefore qualified to play this tournament and they are eight players and the winner of this tournament will win the right to challenge the world chess champion Ding Liren and uh, every other year we have a candidates tournament every other year we have a world championship match and Hikaru Nakamura also qualified for the candidates tournament in the last cycle and that was where he lost his game so he has been unbeaten for one and a half year playing a professional chess Vidit with the black pieces here is from India he is 29 years old and he is a genius chess player but he is very often 
Overshadowed by uh, younger uh, Indian chess prodigies, namely Ramesh Babu Pragnananda and Gukesh, who are also playing in the candidates tournament. They are younger, on paper they are stronger, so we did often get forgotten a little bit well. If you sleep on Vidit, I hope you have a good night's sleep. <laughs> but uh, but after this game, I think his name is about to be immortal because what he does here is just absolutely, absolutely amazing and beautiful. So without further ado, let's take a look at the game. Nakamura with the white pieces plays knight to f3 and we see knight to c6 by Vidit. So we are currently in what is known as the opening phase of the game where the two players are battling for control of the center squares. This knight is attacking this pawn and this knight is defending the pawn. And you can see that white has an advantage because white goes first. So white is the one able to attack the opponent and black has to defend. Among chess professionals, having the white pieces is a great advantage. Here we get an opening known as the Rui Lopez or Spanish opening after 15th century Spanish bishop, not chess bishop, but actual actual bishop, who was archbishop, royal archbishop actually, of Spain. His name was Ruy Lopez, and he was one of the first to write a book about this particular opening. They call it the Rolls Royce of chess, because uh, as a chess professional, this is one of the main things that you really have to know, and you have to know it to an extreme depth. In this position there are many moves. There's the Morphe defense with pawn to a3 attacking the bishop. But very, very popular is knight to f6 attacking this pawn here. This was a forgotten move for most of chess history. It was considered pretty bad uh, until uh, the World Championship match in 2000 where Kremnik, Vladimir Kremnik, challenged the uh, virtually unbeatable Garry Kasparov, uh, who had been world champion for 15 years at this point. And he showed up at the board and he played this opening in all the games where he was able to with the black pieces and showed that this opening is actually extremely hard to beat and this opening more or less allowed Vladimir Kremnik to beat Kasparov in 2000 and become world champion. It's known as the Berlin defense and Nakamura is a little bit reluctant, he's a little bit hesitant to go into the Berlin defense which is why he plays pawn to d3 which is known as the anti Berlin, meaning that he wants to get back into a variation um, that looks more like the Ruy Lopez, the Spanish. He does not want to go down this route of, uh, of the Berlin. We are going to see many, many brilliant moves in this video, and that's why it makes a lot of sense that the video is sponsored by Brilliant. So let me tell you about that for just a short while before we get on with the game. Brilliant is a fantastic learning tool that I use a lot myself and really enjoy. You can learn just about anything there and the whole point is that this is beautiful, intuitive and satisfying to use. I highly recommend it and I even have a link in the description that will give you a free 30-day trial where you get to enjoy the premium version for free for a month. 
and you can also get a 20% discount on an annual premium subscription. Brilliant.org slash ASMR chess. So thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Okay, so in this position, back to the game, the cool, calm and collected, sin-like, vidit Gujarati plays bishop out to c5. With this move he is saying, okay, you don't want to play the Berlin. You are wasting a little bit of time by playing this pawn out to d3. Well, then I'm going to assert my will on the position a little bit. I'm going to play this move, it's a little bit aggressive. Looking here at the d4 square, making it hard for you to play pawn to d4. And Nakamura at this point is still happy with everything uh, because now he's back in um, the openings that he has studied, that he knows very well, and he, is, he thinks he is dictating the game. He plays pawn to c3. What is this about? This is about uh, at some point being able to establish the center pawn duo. He wants to push this pawn forward uh, and then it would be supported by this c3 move. So he's looking to get into the Rui Lopez structures um, and he's just doing it in this anti-Berlin way. And with it, he castles here and he is 100% completely zoned in. He's, you know, sometimes I think about what would it take for me, for instance, to beat an unbeatable player like Nakamura. And if you look at this game, you can see what it takes. You have to be completely zoned in. I can't make any mistakes because if you make a mistake, a super genius like Nakamura is going to, to understand that you made a mistake and he's going to punish you for the mistake. But if you're playing with the black pieces, it's not enough to just not make any mistakes. At the very best, you will get a draw. You're not going to win if you just don't make any mistakes. What you also have to do is you have to have studied all of the games that your opponent has played for yeah, maybe their entire career. So you understand all the opening sequences that they like to play. You have to understand, for instance, okay, if I go for the Berlin, he's likely go to go for the anti-Berlin. Then I'm going to go for this variation. And then if he goes for this, I will go for that. If he goes for that, I will go for this. And that's still not enough. Then what you have to do is that you will have to have found a new move in the opening that your opponent has never seen before. Never seen before. And it has to be a good move. So finding a move that, first you have to correctly guess all the moves that your opponent will play. Then you will have to find a good move that they have not seen before. And they spend, of course, hours and hours every day analyzing games and analyzing openings. So it has to be a wildly creative and original move with a hidden point that makes it so that they have not studied it. And then you have to play perfectly. So that's why I guess that we did started out this game with a bit of a meditation because I can understand why he would want to block out every everything else except for this beautiful beautiful world of dark and light squares and pieces and simple rules. Nakamura also castles. The game is still following what is known as theory, meaning that this game has been played before. After
after white castles, white is actually threatening now to play bishop takes knight, so that the knight will no longer be defending. We we'll see something like bishop takes knight if it was white's move. Maybe pawn takes bishop and nothing is defending this e5 pawn, so knight could come in and capture it, which is why we see pawn to d6 from Vidit. Pawn to d6, of course, defends e5, but it does something else. It also opens up the bishop. The bishop, if it were black to move, could come here with a nasty pin on the knight. The pin is when the bishop is x-ray attacking a piece behind the knight. So if the knight moves, oops, you lose the queen. And that is uh, an awkward position for white to be in. Therefore, white plays pawn to h3. Because if we see bishop here, we can just capture it with the pawn. And here we see kind of a curious move. Knight goes back to e7. Knight e7 played after h3. And this is pretty standard in this opening. It's seen maybe 200 times before, 300 times. At the Grandmaster level, usually this knight wants to come maybe to g6, maybe looking at to come to f5. There it will be maybe exchanged off because like maybe white would capture it with the bishop. It would be an exchange because it would be attacking the king position, something like this, something like this. And when it's leaving the pawn, uh, the knight is leaving here from c6, it uh, quits its job. It has a job here which is to defend against things landing on d5. When it goes here, starting this other new plane, it allows Nakamura to play pawn to d4. And in, in this position, we've seen this yeah, some 200 times before, 300 times. And in like 99% of the games, we will see the bishop drop back. And like in 1% of the games, we may see pawn takes pawn. And in 0% of the games, we see pawn to c6. But that is exactly what Vidit played. So this is what is known as a novelty. Novelty, novelty, novelty. In chess, a new move. And it's very clear to Nakamura at this point. Oops. Um, my opponent played something that I have never seen before. Clearly they have studied this at home. They have a huge team of people uh, helping them, analyzing computers. Um, so now it's a, a bit of a problem. It's not like this move is winning in itself. It's just that he who chooses the battlefield wins the war, in the words of Sun Tzu. And uh, Nakamura is in a bit of unknown territory now. There is uh, some tension in this position because both of the bishops are attacked. So you could play, Nakamura could play, pawn takes bishop, could absolutely play that, but then we would see pawn take bishop, pawn takes bishop, and this is sort of the obvious line, this is the first thing that Nakamura would calculate, and he can see that maybe he can here capture the knight here, and he has actually won a pawn, the bishops have been exchanged and he is up one pawn. The problem is that this pawn, even though it is currently attacking this knight, will become a liability. The knight will move probably to g6 and 
there is a lot of variations a lot of calculation uh, you'll have to do uh, from here but this is a bit awkward for white you'll have to try to defend this pawn here on e4 but you can't defend it with the knight because then you lose this pawn immediately and black gets a lot of play and uh, it's there's no way real really to fight for any serious advantage here so this whole variation even though even though it it may be the best option does not look particularly promising nakamura is looking for something better this is the most important tournament he wants to qualify to play for the world championship and win you know a million dollars or one and a half million dollars or however much money it is they win and the prestige and and everything so he uh, he goes for trying to win the game plays a more ambitious move he ambitious move <laughs> it's an an ambitious move is an ambitious move with a bishop i guess so uh bishop back to d3 bishop d3 bishop d3 going out of the attack ignoring this not capturing here but going out of the attack and with it drops his bishop back to b6 and now we see the reason that Nakamura did this because he thinks that he's gaining an advantage here he can win a pawn at least he thinks that he can win a pawn how well with this knight moving one thing it was doing when it was here was it was attacking Well, when the knight was here on c6, it was, of course, attacking on d4. It was also defending on e5. If you count, we have one, two attackers on e5, and only one defender. So Nakamura does the natural thing. He plays d takes e5. D takes e5 from Vidit, just saying, oh, just come, just bring it. And Nakamura plays knight takes e5. So what did he miss? What is the brilliant idea behind all of this? 100% correctly predicted by Vidit. What is the idea? When the commentators saw this move, they freaked out. When I saw this move, I freaked out. This is wild. This is amazing. Actually, white no longer has any advantage. Usually, or not usually, white always starts with an advantage just because they go first. But in this position, there is a move that completely equalizes the game. Not only does it equalize the game actually um, it is extremely difficult for white to play there is a way to fight for a draw for white there's no way to fight for a win anymore and the move the star move of this game one of them there's there are many really cool moves but it all begins with bishop takes h3 And now we are playing chess. So what on earth is going on? The first question, of course, is why can't I just capture that bishop? Because the bishop is better than the pawn, so why can't I just capture the bishop? And pawn takes bishop. It's the move that you have to look at. And Nakamura, of course, in his mind's eye, he looked at this. This is not what the game is. This is. We are now seeing this in the, in the mind of Nakamura. What he was calculating and what is the problem here? The problem in this position 
is this knight. And you can attack this knight with the queen in a very advantageous way. But there is only one way to do it. There is only one way to play for black here. You could attack the knight from this square. You could attack the knight from this square. But the only square that works is to go to b8 to attack the knight. And there is a very particular reason for this. The point is that now bishop to f4 doesn't really work to protect the knight. Because the bishop here can drop back and we have a pin again bishop to c7 and there's no way to defend this knight anymore and if you move the knight i capture the bishop you cannot move the knight to a square where you protect the bishop both because it's attacked twice and also because there's something here it could go here but of course i'll just capture it Nevertheless, this is actually the best that uh, that white can hope for, actually. And after this, the point is that you have to just play bishop to something like g3 and just give up the knight and then play f4. This is actually uh, what you have to do. And then you are fighting for a draw with white. Um, this is, of course, an extremely hard variation to calculate. Also, also, why is it that we can't just move the knight? Why can't we just move the knight? Why can't we just say, that's no problem, I'll just go back to f3? What are you doing? What is this sacrifice all about? This bishop here on b6 is maybe the star piece. If the other one was the star move with bishop takes h3, then this is the star piece of the game. Because this bishop on b6 would in this position allow queen g3 check. And this is why Nakamura decided to not go for this line. This is losing. Um, there's only one legal move. King h1. You play queen takes h3. Um, the best move here is knight back to h2. And uh, now this bishop on d3 is in trouble. It's attacked by the queen. And we can play rook a to d8, we could also use the f8 rook, and the bishop is pinned to the queen, we are going to come in, capture the bishop, and we're calculating, calculating, he's looking at all this after bishop takes h3, going further down the line, further down the line, okay, can I defend this, I could play pawn to f3, I could play pawn to f3, blocking the queen's view of the bishop. Um, so now it's only attacked by the rook. But then the knights jump into the game. Looking at the king here, we would see knight h5 um, with the idea of knight here and checkmate. So we go back. Two knight takes h3, excuse me, bishop takes h3. In this position here, Nakamura calculated all of this and decided I'm not going to capture the bishop. I'm not going to capture the bishop. Instead, he uh, decided that the most... Uh, important feature of this position 
is this bishop here on b6, pinning this pawn here, which maybe you didn't see. So just in case you already typed out a comment saying something like, oh, you could just capture the queen. Let me show you. If pawn takes here, queen here is the same variation again, again, knight back, queen g3, the point here is the bishop pins this pawn, you cannot capture the queen because you would lose your king. You're not allowed to do that, that would lose you the game. So, so, um, So Nakamura decided that this bishop x-ray attacking the king is the most important feature of the position. He played knight to c4. And the point is that he wants to capture the bishop here. He would be recaptured maybe by the queen, but then black's attack loses its uh, bite and he can fight. But here Vidit is still in his home preparation. As we say in chess, this is, he's still very comfortably um, in his preparation. He has seen this before. He has studied this with his team, with his computer. He knows exactly what to do. And he, uh, he squeezes the last drop of advantage out of this bishop and plays the other bishop to g4 with an attack on the queen, exploiting the fact that you cannot chase away the bishop with the pawn to f3 because of the pin against the king. So the queen now has to move, it goes to c2, and only after this, only after the bishop has moved out of this attack from this pawn with tempo, only now we see bishop c7 saying, okay, you're not allowed to capture on b6. I may come back to b6. I may come back to b6, but not right now. At this point, I think maybe I'll take just a second to say that if you like the video and if you would like to see some more ASMR chess videos, some exclusive, ooh, exclusive ASMR chess videos, I have a Patreon that I use to try to make this into a professional channel and everybody who supports me there gets access to ex exclusive uh, chess videos and the ASMR chess discord and a bunch of other fun things. Um, so if you want to help me keep the channel going and make ever more ASMR chess content, consider going there. There's a link in the description. All of this probably still looked kind of okay to Nakamura. Of course he's saying, okay, there was this surprise in the opening, but I've been reacting quite well. I didn't get into some uh, checkmate uh, trap with capturing the bishop and all of this. And now I'm getting back into it. I can uh, exert my will on the position. I can play pawn to e5, bet you didn't see that coming, this is the kind of move that I love to play, I play a lot of openings where I have this battery of the queen and bishop and every time I can play pawn to e5 and attack a knight here, I'm usually very very happy, because the knight has an important job, it's looking at h7, defending h7, once the knight moves, as it did, to d7 in this game, then you can play bishop takes h7 with check, so now both players have lost their h-pawn. Vidit it. is completely unfazed, he is allowing all of this, he has calculated all of this, he plays king to h8. And here you have to find a very, very deep move. You have to actually allow, have to actually allow this bishop to be trapped. 
Nakamura played the bishop back to d3. Why? Because if you don't, if you play something else, then oops, pawn to g6, bishop cannot get back, queen no longer defending the bishop, king will capture the bishop. It's a very common trap. This You actually have to allow this in this position. A lot of crazy stuff happens there. Instead, Nakamura went back to d3 for very subtle reasons. This is not good enough. First of all, black pieces are all back here, except for this one, and all white pieces are all back there. So it does look kind of equal. It's not equal. Black key pieces can spring to life very, very, very quick, quickly, because um, the sender control that white has is not real. It's an illusion. Black plays pawn to b5. This attacks the knight. The knight has to move. Going here doesn't work. Knight to d6 doesn't work, not because I'm going to capture the knight, but because I'm going to capture on e5 taking away the defense of the knight, then I'm going to capture the knight. I'm going to continue with my attack. Which is why we see knight to e3 attacking the bishop. But this is why we are now going to see why it's just an illusion with all these pieces here on the back uh, on this side of the board, it looks like they're so far away from the king. Actually, they can get close to the king very, very, very quickly. And it all starts with knight takes e5. Now, material equality has been restored. Three pawns lost for both sides. But this knight is attacking this bishop along with the queen. It is also at defending this bishop here. So if takes here we have our pick we can either capture this bishop or we could recapture here which is probably what we want to do because if you look at this this is not what happened but we have these checks incoming the queen will have to get this guy out of the way the knight and then come in with checkmate attacks here this looks extremely dangerous this is not the sort of thing that we are going to see. Not here, it was here attacking this. And of course also the, this bishop is attacked and Nakamura seems to try to solve both problems. He moves the bishop back. It's no longer attacked. It is attacking this bishop along with this knight. It looks like he's fighting back. But the problem here really We'll see this later in the game as well. Is yes, he's defending against the threats. Um, he's not losing his pieces. He has the same amount of pieces as his opponents, but it's actually an illusion because Vidit really has the pieces. They're all doing something. They are going to do something, even the rooks. Not so much in the game now, but they have a way to get into the game. These three pieces here, the rook, the knight, and the bishop, not only are they not in the game, but Nakamura is not moving in such a way as to make it possible for them to get in the game. So he's actually, you could say, down a lot of material here. You could almost take these two pieces completely off the board for the rest of the game, and it wouldn't really matter, actually, um, which is very instructive. And I don't fault him. I mean, this is not because he's not aware that he should use these pieces. He's just not given the chance to. Because Vidit is playing this perfect game. And, um, yeah, I found one inaccuracy in the game, by the way. I'll talk to you about it. Like one, in quotation marks, mistake that Vidit played, which is later in the game, uh, when he is 100% completely winning, he played a move that is still 100% completely winning, but wins a little slower than some other move. That is his 
inaccuracy, although the, otherwise he played it just a perfect game. Uh, like this is a historical game, you know, beating uh, forty-seven or like is it forty-three or forty-seven on beaten game streak for Nakamura, one and a half years, one of the hardest players in the world to beat, maybe the only one who's harder to beat than Magnus Carlsen, and then to do it in such a way, uh, it's just absolutely amazing. Okay, so what happens after the bishop attacks here? We see pawn to f5 defending the bishop from Vidit. Pawn to f5 defending the bishop. And um, the point is very, very, uh, very hard to actually capture the bishop because if this pawn recaptures, we are also opening up the rook. You see, just just before with the pawn back here, this rook wasn't doing anything, but actually it could spring to life very quickly, plays a very re relevant part of the game. Nakamura is saying, I want that too. So he plays f4. He's not capturing here, he's not allowing more of the pieces to flow in the game. He's trying to counterattack actually with exactly the same idea. This His move, maybe it even looks better, because you could say it's attacking the knight, right? If it's true, it is attacking the knight. But what's crazy is that Vidit is playing with such focus, and here he is obviously out of preparation, he has not seen this position before, but he's still playing perfect moves, and he's so in the zone that he's not going to do something automatic, like, oh, my knight is attacked, I'm going to move the knight. No, he finds the star piece of the game, and he recognizes, oh, the king on this dark squared diagonal has been a problem. Now it's even more of a problem because now the pawn isn't here to defend the king. So he plays bishop back to b6. And he's not going to win this knight back immediately if uh, he captures here. But this knight is not going to be able to be saved and it cannot move because it's pinned to the king so it doesn't work to capture the knight it's a long variation that you may want to explore yourself instead Nakamura is of course sensing the danger and actually maybe even if he played perfectly from now on wouldn't be able to 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 even get a draw from here but he is sensing the danger and he's sensing some some things he's sensing that if he ever wants to capture this knight this queen may be able to come in here or even if this knight ever moves it could come all the way over here with checkmating attacks so he tries something very daring, he plays king f2. This does a lot of things, it allows the rook to come in here and check the king that will be important later. It also defends the knight for a little bit. Just for a little while, it defends the knight along with the bishop. What's the one thing it doesn't do? It's not helping any of these guys. It's not helping any of these guys. Vidit, of course, completely zoned in, not moving this knight, no, 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 he plays knight d5, now the last uh, minor piece is in the game, and here uh, we see the point of Nakamura's play, rook h1, this checks the king looks like a desperado move, king moves out of the way, what did you really achieve, well what you achieved here is that there is now no queen h5 check because that's defended now queen h5 doesn't work and uh, what Nakamura wanted to play after this preparatory idea he played now f takes d f takes e5 takes the knight and this knight is defended twice it's attacked twice 
in Ak Nakamura's Obapon. This is actually the first minor piece that has been captured in the game. Uh, before that, only three pawns had fallen. What happens now? Well, of course, we cannot go in via h4. We can, however, go in via g5, attacking the knight. So we're going to win this knight right back. You can't defend it, or rather you can, let's say you play queen d3 to defend the knight. And the problem is, probably it's best to play bishop takes bishop first, but the problem is that when you push this pawn, which you can now very freely do, you have this problem that this knight can't move because it's pinned. There's nothing you can do. Like you're going to lose this knight right back. Which is why um, Nakamura tries to hide his king away. So king back to e1 from whence it came. And uh, this is the one inaccuracy by Viditz. He captures the knight with the bishop. It would have won a little faster according to the computer to capture it with the knight. However, this is the less risky way to win. This is um, the more human way to win. This is the easier way to win. From now on, it's it's a matter of what these uh, super geniuses, they call it technique, uh, converting this into a full point. But it's... To put it very mildly, not uh, not easy. Uh, if I played this position a uh, hundred times against Nakamura, I would lose every single time. Uh, if I uh, if I had my memory wiped at least, <laughs> like if I couldn't learn from it, if you just dropped me down here and said, "Okay, play this against Nakamura," I would lose. It's not easy. Chess is a hard game, but Vidi sure makes it look easy. Bishop takes bishop, but it's the light squared bishop capturing the bishop on g4. Trying to get the attackers out of his home. Queen takes g4, no problem. And now bishop takes bishop on e3. Knight takes bishop. And now only two attacking pieces at this very moment. The rook is still behind this pawn. This rook is not doing much. So maybe you could survive this. Actually you can't, but that's the kind of thing that Nakamura is thinking about. This is attacked. The queen is attacked, therefore queen to e2. Queen g3 check. By Vidit, super precise, uh, proof super precise move. Point is that you can't block this with the queen. I'll just come and capture this pawn here on e5, and I will have all these discoveries. This is deadly. The king can't go anywhere to protect itself from these discoveries, where, for instance, could win the rook. Uh, or rather it can, but the only way it could would to be go to this open file where the rooks would activate with checks. So this is this is a very quick um, loss. So you can't block with the queen. You cannot go here because of the knight. So king here. Um, the only way. This also allows rook a d8 check. Now you could of course stop the check with the queen, you would lose your queen. So even faster way to lose the game. Or you can move the king, king to c1. c2 of course, attacked by the knight, so king c1. And now a new discovery threat. Queen g5, thinking about now I can move the knight somewhere, wherever wherever I go, it will be check, it will coordinate with the rook. The king needs somewhere to go. 
therefore pawn to b3 so it can go out of the discovered check and what would you play how would you finish the game there's a very nice move here i think uh knight f1 that could just be taken if it were not for the simple fact that this is check a discovery or discovered check now the queen attacks the king the king the king and uh, actually nakamura resigned but for us mere mortals we want to know why and uh, here comes the reason so king b1 there was made room for this with the pawn to b3 trying to get to safety also uh, protect these pieces maybe protect the rook maybe someday you can play the knight out okay what happens knight g3 this is what is known as a fork attacking the rook attacking the queen you want to save the queen you want to save the rook you can save both but maybe you can play the queen back take the knight and defend the rook so when knight takes rook at least you can play queen takes knight and okay you lost a rook for a knight the rook is considered to be better than the knight but is it so bad and if you're a super gm and you're playing somebody like me it wouldn't be that bad if you're playing against vidit who is completely zoned in this is hopeless, completely hopeless. Why? It's because of these two. So queen e3 is the move. Now, what is the position? Why is this so hopeless? I'm going as black to capture this pawn, maybe with the f rook. Just play rook f to uh, e8 and capture here. I'm going to use these two rooks on these open files to attack the king. This is a long-term plan. The point of, of it all is, there's just no way you can stop it. There's nothing you can do. White effectively only has this piece. Only one queen against a queen and two rooks. Why is that? Well, the knight here cannot move because it cannot go here loses immediately to rook takes knight of course and if it if white is you know not content <laughs> playing with only one piece against a uh, queen and two rooks and tries to get the knight out somewhere else the only way is a3 this crucially takes away the escape square uh, and rook check now either you go into a self pin which i as well attack you again and you can try to defend this but there's no way to defend it enough times so i'll come with the other rook as well you either do that excuse me this is the position after this rook move you could either go into a self pin where I could, you know, make any kind of discovery I want. It's not actually going to change. You could also go to B1. And the, just one little piece of accuracy is needed here. You don't go directly for the checkmate with queen takes here, for checkmate here, because that would allow the queen to come in to defend. Instead, you just slide over now. It's better... You play this check you could put the knight and i'll just capture that so the only move is king c1 queen takes king back and queen b8 is checkmate i think it's very fitting that this is where the king would end up getting checkmated because here he's still blocking in this rook that has you know this rook was kind of what it was all about this whole game the rook and the knight not getting into the game because of the brilliant attacking play by vidit before i conclude the video i just say that 
if you like these pieces, you'd notice that they are actually the same pieces that they are playing with in the candidates tournament. They're also the same pieces that they will play with in the World Championship. These are the World Chess Design. And if you like them, you can buy them. I have a link in the description and then a promo code. It's all in the description. We'll give you a 10% off. It will take you right to their shop. Indeed, everything you buy in their shop with that code, uh, you will get a 10% discount. And you will also be supporting this channel. So that's also something you can consider. For now... All I have to say is that I'm very, very happy that you watched this video, that you got all the way here to the end. Um, makes me extremely happy. I hope you had a good time. I hope I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.